furniture making company. And they make beautiful pieces like this round table made out of cherry with these ironwood inlays. Over here, an armoire with Biedemeyer influence made out of mesquite wood. And look at the craftsmanship. They actually have book matched the panels. And the character of the mesquite just really brings the piece alive. Now, across the way is a piece I'm really interested in. This glass front case has a bit of a Victorian influence, raised panels on the end. And wherever there are defects in the mesquite, they simply fill them with epoxy and then machine them smooth. On the other side of the room is a similar piece, except this one is arts and crafts and green and green in influence. The green and green being this arch and these square ironwood pegs, which are just proud of the surface. Now, this one is made out of cherry. The other day, they were working on a piece being made out of mesquite back in the shop. I don't think they'd mind if we took a look. Well, I feel right at home back here in the workshop. And at this station, Luciano is working on a Biedermeyer chair. The lighter wood is the mesquite, and the dark wood of the backrest is the ironwood. Over here, Otto is working on a 65-year-old hollow chisel mortising machine. Works as good as the day it was first made. Sure wish we had one of those. Over here, Tim has the job of filling the defects in the mesquite with the marine epoxy, the same stuff we use to build the sailboat. Now over here, Chris is laying out a top that's going to go on that base. And doesn't this mesquite look great? Well, we can pick up some tips in the finishing room. Here, Charles is doing the final sanding on this mission-style saddle with 320-grit sandpaper. And over here, Carl is putting on the first coat of finish, a Danish oil. And doesn't that really bring out the beauty of the mesquite? And over here, Costello is doing the final coat, a tongue oil-based product that really protects the piece. Let's see, I wonder where they put that bookcase that I was looking for. Ah, here it is, nearly complete. Steve and Jim are putting on the final touches. Can I see one of the knobs that you're going to use? Boy, look at this. Isn't that beautiful? Ironwood, nicely shaped, with a dowel pin to secure it to the door. Right about there, I guess. Thanks, Steve. That's a nice piece. Where am I going to get the mesquite? Well, it wasn't easy. But eventually, I found mesquite wood just outside of Tucson. However, there was a very limited supply, and it was difficult to find enough pieces large enough to build our bookcase. So it took me over a half a day sorting through stock to get enough material for two. And it didn't come cheaply, $695 for the stock I brought back, and I had to truck it. But here's the result. Our prototype is a reasonable facsimile of the one we saw in Tucson. Now, the mesquite is a little tough on the tools, and does require more sanding to get a surface smooth enough for the finish, but I think it's worth it. The wood is beautiful. The first thing I want to do today is take some stock and prepare these panels on the ends of the cabinet. I've saved one of the best pieces of mesquite so that I don't have to glue up the panel. It's an inch and a quarter thick, which will give me two panels. I've already taken some epoxy and filled the defects, the same material they were using in the shop, and the first thing I want to do is rip off the unusable material on the edge. To do that, I'll use the table saw. But before we use any power tools, let's take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Boy, this stuff is heavy. If I'm careful, I'll be able to get both pieces out of this board. I'll run it through my bandsaw, or resaw as it's known. But I think it would be a good idea to surface plane both sides of this before I run it through the resaw. Now, this is tough on the planer knives, 
and I'll only remove a little bit of material with each pass. Boy, that's a great tool. That three inch blade goes through this mesquite without any problem. Now what I want to do is surface plane the piece down to a little thicker than three eighths of an inch. This machine is a drum sander. Underneath this housing, there are two drums with two different grits of sandpaper. 80 on the front, 120 on the outside. It makes the pieces nice and smooth, removing any planer marks and absolutely uniform in thickness. After the resaw, a few more defects showed up in the pieces I'm going to use as the panels, so I want to fill them. First, I apply some masking tape on the back side so the filler won't go through. I've mixed up some epoxy, just like you saw at the shop. It's a hardener, a resin, a little bit of filler, and some graphite to give it the black color. It's all part of a boat building system that we've used before. And I simply pour it into the defect and it should seek its way through. It'll take a couple hours for it to actually harden and then I'll be able to sand it smooth with the surface. And when it's all done, there will be no hole in the wood and there'll be a patch which will hardly be noticed. While the epoxy cures on those panels, I'm working on other components for our cabinet. These inch and seven eight square pieces are the corner post, and they also require mortises, one at the top and one down here at the bottom for rails, which will connect the pieces. I'm making the mortises at my designated mortiser. I've set it up with a three eighths inch square chisel. The drill bit in the center removes most of the material, and the chisel squares it up. Next, I want to make a groove in the post that will run from mortise to mortise, and that will receive the side panel. To make the groove, I've installed a 3 8 inch straight cutting bit in my router table, adjusted the height to 3 8 of an inch, and I've transferred marks back to show me the leading and trailing edges of the bit. That will allow me to drop the post onto the bit right in the area of the mortise. And when I reach the mortise at the other end, I'll simply remove the post. Let's take a look at the back of our prototype. The back is a piece of quarter inch plywood and rather than just apply it to the post, I've recessed it in so that we won't see the edge. For that, I need a rabbit and we'll make that next. While the dado head is still in the saw, I want to work on this lower front rail. It needs a rabbet on the top inside edge to support the bottom shelf. With the fence in the same position, but the dado head lowered to an eighth of an inch, I've just run a groove in a piece which is going to become the lower rail on the side. And that groove will catch that lower shelf. With the same setup in the router table that I used to make grooves in the corner post, I'm putting a groove in that lower short rail. I'm also going to need a groove in the top rail using the same setup. Now I'm ready to start forming tenons on the ends of all the rails. And for that, I've set up the table saw for a one inch long tenon. I've raised the blade a quarter of an inch above the table. And I'll use my miter gauge to guide the piece through, making a shoulder cut on each face. Using a special jig, which holds pieces of wood vertically so that I can run them through the saw, I can complete the cheek cuts on each tenon. 
Using my band saw, I can make the decorative cut that runs along the bottom of the short rails and the front rail. Along the inside of the face frame rail, the top one, and the top rail of the end panels, I'm going to mill some small pockets. And they will receive these wooden clips through which I'll put a screw to secure the top to the case. Look again at the prototype and you'll see that there are holes in each post. And they are to receive these little clips which support the adjustable shelves. To drill those holes, I'm using a specialty jig, which has a whole series of, of holes evenly spaced. My router is equipped with a collar, which fits into the larger hole, and a quarter-inch router bit will plunge in and make the cut. Well, after I finish milling the holes in the other three posts, it'll be time for a little sanding. I've started by making a mortise for the decorative ironwood pegs. If you remember, the original had pegs at the intersections of the carcass and at all the intersections of the door. I have to make the mortise for the pegs on the front of this post because once the side is assembled, I can't fit it into my mortiser. Now I'm ready to do some glue up. Now that's not a mistake down at the bottom of the mortise, that gap. I don't want the tenon to bottom out. Boy, that's going to be a good strong joint. <laughs> Next, the panel itself. And I don't use any glue in the grooves. I want the panel to float so that it can move with changes in moisture content. All right, we'll set this aside and make another one. I've just notched the corners of a piece of birch plywood, which I'm using for the shelves and the back. Doesn't make sense to use mesquite there. It's just too expensive. Now let's work on the top. If we look at the prototype, you can see that the back edge of the top has a rabbit to receive the plywood. We'll make that with a router. You'll notice that I stop short of the end. I'll square up this corner with a chisel. edges of my top, just using a portion of a quarter inch rounding over bit. With the glue dry and the clamps removed from one of the panels, I'm drilling the mortises for the ironwood pegs. Had I done them earlier, the hole would have filled up with glue. Of course, I have no choice with the ones on the front because I can't fit the panel in the mortiser. Before I install the pegs, I want to sand all the intersections flush because the pegs are proud of the surface. I don't want to grind those down. Now for the pegs themselves. I bought some ironwood in Tucson, the same place I got the mesquite. This is not sold by the board foot. It's sold by the pound. 
$6 a pound. Then I ripped it into some quarter inch square strips. And what I'm doing now is just rounding over the end, the part of the peg that's going to show. Now I happen to have this little glue injector to put a bit of glue in the mortise. And then we set the peg in position. Tap it in. Now I'm ready to start some of the assembly. Glue on all the tenons and in all the mortises. The back is a piece of quarter inch birch plywood and it's been pre-stained to approximate the color of the mesquite when it's oiled. I'll just attach that with a bit of glue and some brads. In order to attach the top to the case, I first nail the plywood in that rabbit I made in the top. To further secure the top, I'm going to use these wooden clips. You've seen me use these before. I make them at the table saw and drill a hole for a screw. They're going to slip into the pockets I machined earlier, and then I just drive the screw home. It won't take long for the glue to dry on the case, but while it does, let's start working on the doors. If we look at the doors of the prototype, you can see that they are the most significant feature of this piece. This arch in the mid rail gives it that green and green influence. Once again, I'll be using the ironwood pegs as a feature, and the top has true divided lights for the glass. The first step is to rabbit the styles, rails, and the muttons to receive the glass. To make the rabbit, I've set up my stacked dado head cutter in the table saw. I have this wooden auxiliary fence so that the blade won't hit the metal fence, and I've installed this featherboard to keep the stock tight to the table. The setup is for a quarter inch by half inch rabbit. This is the decorative center rail that has the curved cut in it. The bottom edge needs a larger rabbit to receive the glass from below. This first pass starts the rabbit. I'll remove the rest with a saw blade. Now I've switched over to a quarter inch chisel from my mortising machine, and there are plenty of mortises in these doors. It'll take a while. Let's start forming the tenons on the rails. The first cut is on the face of the rail, an inch and a quarter from the end, and a quarter inch deep. Now I'm making the shoulder cut on the inside face, and that's a quarter of an inch shorter than the one on the outside. Without moving the fence, but raising the blade to 3 eighths of an inch, I've nibbled away the tenon on the edge opposite the rabbit. Now for the cheek cuts. Once again, I'm using my tenon cutter. I'm going to make the cheek cut on the outside face first, then lower the blade and make the cuts on the inside.
And that takes care of the cut for the decorative mid rail. Once again, I'm pre-drilling a couple of the mortises for the iron wood pegs in an area of the door I won't be able to reach once it's assembled. All right, let's glue it up. Once again, glue on the tenons and in the mortises, and then we'll clamp it. All right, that takes care of one door. One more to go. Now those doors are going to be hinged on the case, so I'll need a mortise on the case and on the door. I made a simple jig out of half-inch thick plywood and cut out a notch in it. Then I'll use my router, which is equipped with a collar and a straight-cutting bit. The collar just rides around the cutout in the plywood. Boy, look at how those ironwood pegs just pop out when the oil goes on. Just as they did with the piece in Tucson, we're using an oil finish. I'll put on several coats. Each coat goes on with a brush. I wipe off any excess. And after about eight hours, I'll put on another coat. And we keep building it up. It really brings out the beauty and warmth of this mesquite. Well, there it is with three coats of oil and some double-strength glass in the doors. Now all we need are the books.